on World News Tonight. Climate call out. Low lying nations decry passive approach in addressing climate change. Amending ties. Australia reaches out to France after the AUKUS deal dust settles down. Booster battle. The CDC backs the elderly in getting an extra jab. Baby boom. One company reaps the benefits of a pay raise in the form of a bundle of new members. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with more updates from the UNGA. Leaders from several countries at this week's United Nations General Assembly implored development economies to curb their greenhouse gas emissions as rising sea levels imperiled islands and now lying nations, low-lying nations at the mercy of water. The world simply cannot delay climate ambition any further. Faced with what they see as an existential threat, leaders from low-lying and island nations implored rich countries at the United Nations General Assembly this week to act more forcefully against a warming planet. Marshall Islands President David Kabua said his country was under threat from rising sea levels and that the 2015 Paris Agreement on climate change must be delivered in action, not empty words. On Thursday, Guyana's president criticized large polluters for not delivering on promises to curb emissions, accusing them of deception and failure. We hold out similar hope that the world's worst emitters of greenhouse gases that are threatening the welfare of all mankind will also come to the realization that in the end it will profit them little to emerge king over a world of dust. Speaking at the United Nations Security Council on Thursday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the United States, under President Joe Biden, has prioritized addressing climate change. The climate crisis isn't coming. It's already here. And clear patterns are emerging in its impact. The consequences are falling disproportionately on vulnerable and low-income populations. Blinken also said agreeing that climate change belongs within the purview of the Security Council would send a clear message to the international community about the seriousness of the issue. Russia's deputy UN ambassador disagreed. We believe it is counterproductive to include the climate component in the mandates of peacekeeping and special political missions. Peacekeepers do not have the necessary expertise nor the necessary tools to propose viable solutions for climate change. Biden said earlier this week that he would work with Congress to double funds by 2024 to help developing nations deal with climate change. And on Wednesday, Chinese President Xi Jinping pledged to stop building coal-fired power plants overseas. World leaders will convene again to discuss combating climate change at the COP26 International Climate Summit in Glasgow on November 1st. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said that he had tried to arrange a conversation with French President Emmanuel Macron, saying Australia will be patient in rebuilding ties with France. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said he hasn't been able to reach French President Emmanuel Macron amid a diplomatic row over a major submarine deal. Speaking in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, Morrison showed his resolve. The opportunity for that call is not yet, uh, but we'll be patient. We understand their disappointment. And uh, that is the way you manage difficult issues. Earlier this week, Paris recalled its ambassadors from Canberra and Washington after Australia tore up a French contract for diesel submarines worth tens of billions of dollars. Instead, it signed a new agreement for nuclear-powered submarines and formed a new security alliance with the U.S. and Britain, known as AUKUS. Morrison stuck by his decision to pull out of the deal with France. But at the end of the day, as a government, we have to do what is right for Australia and serve Australia's national security interests. And I will always choose Australia's national security interests first. Washington, however, has had a warmer reception from France as U.S. President Joe Biden spoke to Macron over the phone on Wednesday. After the call, France said its ambassador would return to Washington next week. Morrison was not phased. I look forward to when the time is right and when the opportunity presents that we will have a similar discussion. And I think those issues will take 
uh, further time to work through than the ones that were being dealt with between the United States and France. He said both AUKUS and the new submarine deal had received bipartisan support during his meetings with U.S. lawmakers and officials. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who embarked on a high-level U.S. visit at the invitation of President Joe Biden, meets U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and global CEOs on the first day of his U.S. visit. The Prime Minister was welcomed by senior officials of the Biden administration and India's envoy to the U.S. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India for more on the Prime Minister's visit. Gayatri. Yes, Shenali. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris met Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and welcomed the South Asian nation's decision to resume exports of the COVID-19 vaccine and said both countries must work together to protect democracies around the world. India, the world's biggest maker of COVID-19 vaccine, announced this year that it would resume vaccine exports later this year. India stopped exports in April to focus on inoculating its own population as infections exploded. Modi said India and the US are natural partners having similar geopolitical interests and the two countries were continuously increasing cooperation between them. Indian Prime Minister also met his Japanese counterpart Yoshihide Suga and Australian counterpart Scott Morrison ahead of the meeting of the COD. Modi, Suga and the leaders of the United States and Australia holds a first-in-person summit in Washington aiming to bolster cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region and push back against China's growing dominance. The Quad meeting, as the grouping of the four major democracies is called, will take place just days after the United States, Britain and Australia announced a security pact under which Australia will be provided with nuclear-powered submarines. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting from Delhi in India. Concerns have been raised that EU citizens living in the UK may not be allowed to board flights into the country because of confusion created by new government rules over ID cards and passports. To get more details on this, other than a World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo joins us now from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani. Yes, Shanali. From 1st October, EU citizens who do not have the post-Brexit right to live in the UK will not be able to use EU, EAA or Swiss national ID cards to enter the country. It means that EU citizens not settled in the UK arriving for short visits or visa stays will be required to show a passport under post-Brexit immigration rules. Those settled in the UK can continue to use ID cards until 2025. Brussels fears that airlines will struggle to make the distinction at boarding gates because the UK has not issued EU citizens living in the UK since Brexit with physical residency documents. Instead, airlines will have to log into the government website and check a digital code the passenger can generate on the phone or laptop to prove their status. Such is the concern that the matter was raised as at a meeting last week, the UK-EU Specialised Committee on Citizens' Rights involving officials from the European Commission and the govern UK government. The fear that airlines will refuse to board EU citizens with ID cards because they will not understand the complexities of UK new residency scheme for EU nationals post-Brexit. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adit Arana, World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. The U.S. Special Envoy for Haiti resigned saying he will not be associated with the Biden administration's inhumane counterproduction decision to deport thousands of Haitian refugees from a migrant camp on the U.S.-Mexico border in recent days. The migrant crisis at the U.S. southern border sparked a dramatic diplomatic rebuke on Thursday as the U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti resigned in protest to what he called the inhumane treatment of thousands of Haitian refugees. In a blistering letter to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, diplomat Daniel Foote said, quote, I will not be associated with the United States' inhumane, counterproductive decision to deport thousands of Haitian refugees and illegal immigrants. Haiti, the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, has gone through profound instability in recent weeks, including a presidential assassination, gang violence, and a major earthquake. 
Foote said the Caribbean nation's collapsed state was unable to support the infusion of returning migrants. Many Haitians at the border see refuge in the U.S. as a way to help those back home. U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price called Foote's resignation unfortunate and said he has, quote, mischaracterized circumstances. Foote's departure follows growing pressure on the Biden administration from the United Nations and his fellow Democrats over the treatment of Haitians in a sprawling, impromptu migrant camp in Texas near the Mexican border. Democrats had hoped for an end to deterrent measures brought in by Biden's predecessor, Donald Trump. On the Mexican side of the river early on Thursday, close to 20 police patrol cars lined the bank, overlooking the area where hundreds of Haitian migrants in recent days have crossed back and forth. Many said they were awoken at 6 a.m. by the cars driving through the camp and, fearful of being detained, chose to cross back to the U.S. side. As many as 14,000 people gathered in the camp in Del Rio, Texas, last week. Less than half remain due to expulsions and detentions, while others have left for Mexico to avoid being sent home. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Moving on with an election update. The two candidates running neck and neck to replace Angela Merkel as German Chancellor called for a stronger European Union in a final election debate that did little to shake up a race expected to end in lengthy coalition negotiations. A final televised debate between the top candidates to succeed Angela Merkel. For 90 minutes, representatives of Germany's seven largest parties clashed on issues mostly related to foreign policy, including relations with the EU, Russia and the United States. It was the last chance to impress for candidates hoping to become the country's next chancellor as Germans prepared to head to the polls for Sunday's landmark election. According to the latest polls, three candidates could potentially replace the outgoing German leader. Representing the Greens, Annalena Baerbock is the first member of her party to ever run for chancellor. Polls show her trailing slightly behind the two frontrunners, Armin Laschet of Merkel's CDU party and Olaf Scholz of the center-left SPD, who is also the country's current finance minister. Whoever comes out ahead on Sunday will have to lead Germany into a new post-Merkel era. The landmark election is unlikely to be fully settled by Sunday's vote. Without an absolute majority, the winning party will have to form a ruling coalition in order to get a chancellor elected, a process which could potentially take months. North Korea has reacted to South Korean President Moon Jae-in's proposal for an end-of-war declaration, saying it's too early to consider such a step. North Korea has rejected President Moon's recent proposal to declare a formal end to the 1950-53 Korean War, urging for Washington's withdrawal of its, quote, hostile policy toward the regime. The North's Vice Foreign Minister Lee Taehyung called such a declaration premature in a statement issued by the North state media on Friday. The rejection comes just a matter of days after President Moon proposed at the UN General Assembly that the two Koreas, the US and possibly China, declare an end to the war that technically is still going on following the armistice agreement in 1953. But the statement did leave some room for a compromise. Lee said an end of war declaration is an issue that should be addressed at least once to foster a system that could guarantee peace in the future. Observers note that the North is once again highlighting that practical action to support the declaration is necessary by which it means the withdrawal of U.S. hostile policies. Lee also took issue with Washington's test firing of an ICBM in February and August, as well as its recent decision to help build nuclear-powered submarines for Australia. Experts point out that the North's comments are to make an excuse for its continuous missile development activities, which will be used to continue to put pressure on the U.S. A U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Panel recommended a booster shot of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for Americans aged 65 and older and some adults with underlying medical conditions that put them at risk of severe disease. A CDC panel voted Thursday to recommend booster shots of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine to people ages 65 and older and those at risk for severe disease. 
The vote clears the way for a rollout to begin as early as this week. The booster shots were authorized by the FDA on Wednesday. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Panel declined to recommend boosters for adults ages 18 to 64 who live or work in institutions with high risk of contracting COVID-19, such as healthcare workers, teachers, and residents of homeless shelters and prisons. Some panel members cited the difficulty of implementing such a proposal. The CDC said that some 26 million people in the United States received the second Pfizer shot at least six months ago, including 13 million aged 65 or older. While the infections from the Delta variant may have peaked, there are still concerns on the new strains of the virus, like the new variant called the Mu, that the World Health Organization labeled as a variant of interest. Inside this hospital near Bogota, the fight against COVID has been raging. This patient lying face down told us he'd put off getting vaccinated and got sick. In Colombia, the predominant COVID strain is the Mu variant. It was discovered first here in January. We can conclude that the Mu variant can transmit one or two times more than the original variant described in Wuhan in China. Now, Mu has been identified in all 50 states. It's not nearly as contagious as Delta, but several weeks ago, the World Health Organization labeled it a variant of interest. Right now, it makes up less than 1% of COVID cases in the U.S., though experts say it's slightly more common in places like South Florida because of travel to and from Colombia. We take everything like that seriously, but we don't consider it an immediate threat right now. Still, preliminary data suggests Mu might be more resistant to COVID vaccines than other strains. This week, the WHO reclassified three other variants, Ada, Iota, and Kappa, to monitoring status, saying they no longer pose a major added risk to global public health. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Catalan separatist leader was detained by Italian police in Sardinia. Officials said that he was in the city of Alghero to attend the Adifolk International Exhibition when he was stopped by border police. Five climbers died after they got caught in a sudden snowstorm in Russia, the highest mountain in Europe. The other 14 members of the party were rescued on the peak in the Caucasus in high winds and heavy snow amid temperatures of 20 Celsius. Health workers in India's Himachal Pradesh overcame the challenge of steep topography, walking for hours or days to reach remote villages and administer COVID-19 vaccine doses. One person was killed and at least 12 others were wounded when a gunman opened fire inside a supermarket in suburban Memphis, Tennessee. The gunman was later found dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot. Twitter rolled out a tipping feature which will allow users to send and receive Bitcoin. The company said it will also launch a fund to pay some users who host audio chat rooms on its Spaces feature. Like something you see or hear on Twitter and want to give the content creator a tip? You can now do that with Bitcoin, the social media app announced on Thursday. Twitter's global fan base using Apple iOS devices can start sending and receiving digital payments a feature that was previously limited to a small group for testing. The Silicon Valley company will also launch a fund to pay some users who host audio chat rooms on its Spaces feature. Those are just some of the changes coming to Twitter as it tries to compete against Facebook and YouTube, a unit of Alphabet's Google, in pursuit of content creators who can come with loyal followers in the millions valuable to Twitter's advertisers. In addition, Twitter is testing new ways to help users have a safer experience on its site. It will now include the use of warnings when people enter a, quote, heated conversation and allow users to leave tweet threads they no longer want to engage with. The social network is also exploring how to allow users to filter out certain words they do not want to see in replies to their tweets, which could be vital in halting name calling or abusive speech. These changes are seen as key to Twitter's quest to distance itself from a reputation for being a hotbed of controversy and a site where polarized discussions can get out of hand. 
And finally, tonight, a CEO of a firm gave his employees a minimum salary of $70,000. Since then, there has been a baby boom at the Seattle-based company. Workers say that they feel more financially stable. Co-workers Carrie Chen and Alex Franklin are proud new parents, but at their office, it's no surprise. Do you love her? Baby. 66 new babies in a company with just over 200 employees. All the birth announcements came after this big announcement in 2015. And we're going to have a minimum uh, $70,000 pay rate for everyone that works here. Since the raise at Gravity Payments, CEO Dan Price says 10 times more employees own homes. 70% of them paid down debt. And now there's a baby boom, all born from an economic boom. Hi. If you pay people more, not only do their lives get better, the company gets better and everybody's more successful. Cheers. <laughs> we are right on track for the American dream. You know, we have a beautiful baby boy, a wonderful home. And the company family is still growing. Seven more babies are on the way. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.